Gary O'Brien, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Gary O'Brien is the director of Chance Encounter and The Holy Core, which was recently released. These are both Star Trek fan productions. The new one is getting great rave reviews. Uh, I've watched it a couple of times. Great show. It focuses mostly on the conflict between science and religion, uh, or the harmony between the two. Tell me more about that if you can, Gary. Sure. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, you're right. It's... Um... The film talks a lot about science and religion because we have these alien characters which are very religious uh, in their mindset. And, of course, the Starfleet people are are what they are. They're not known for their uh, religious leanings. So um, what we didn't want to do when we were writing it, though, was kind of set it up as a science versus religion um, and kind of bash religion. Uh, we thought it would be more interesting to just uh, represent both uh, frames of mind the aliens and the starfleet people and just let the characters kind of say how they feel and not really make a judgment call either way ourselves as the makers of the film and just kind of let the audience you know watch it play out and let their own mind uh you know work on what we presented to them yeah it didn't seem to angle one way or the other per se i couldn't quite figure out a bias right cool there isn't one is religion a part of the star trek the next generation universe um in terms of the next generation, and then I, I think probably not in my knowledge, um, obviously the next generation era, which would include Deep Space Nine, obviously that had the Bajorans in it a lot and they had their own religion. Um, but in terms of just Star Trek, the next generation, there was very little direct um, discussion or anything of, of specific like Earth religions, real life ones, I believe in an episode called Data's Day, which is a pretty sort of fun, interesting episode, there's a kind of an offhand comment made about the Hindu festival of lights occurring on board the ship, um, but we don't see it or anything like that. Um, and as far as I know, oh, and also Christmas, we see Christmas in the first Next Generation movie. It's sort of Picard's Nexus thing. So, so there's sort of a bit of precedent that these things haven't entirely died out, but they were kind of very vague about how they, they were perceived um, so which was actually interesting for us when we were writing, because, you know, there had been these discreet mentions of it, um, but they hadn't really staked out a position officially on the show. So it, it kind of let us be free to kind of put our own spin on it without kind of violating any established canon, as it were. It, it, does Picard, does Captain Picard believe in God? Do we even know this? I would have to say that we don't know that for sure. But my personal view would be that he doesn't. Um, I think another thing which may be where they touch on this kind of area is uh, what's it called? Uh, where Silence Has Lease, I think it is. It's a second season episode. And it's this one where they kind of they're just there's some aliens outside and it's going to bust up the ship. So they decide to set auto destruct and sit it out rather than have two thirds of the crew be uh, executed or whatever it is. And anyway, in that scenario, they have a discussion in Picard's quarters about, um, you know, what's the meaning of life and all this kind of stuff. And uh captain picard's character kind of gives us a sort of uh he kind of speaks about how in all the universe's infinite complexity that he thinks there must be more than uh must be more than just the one life the mortal life that we all uh, are living currently but he doesn't beyond logic as it were yes indeed to quote the film yes mm -hmm. um and uh and so yeah i think picard wasn't like completely a spiritual but I certainly am not uh, qualified to comment beyond that, I don't think. So last time we spoke, you had completed the Holy Core. Excuse me. Last time we spoke, you had completed Chance Encounter. Mm -hmm. And you were working on the Holy Core. You were looking for funding. Ultimately, that did happen. Yes. Uh, not through Kickstarter, but through some other means. Yeah, you're right. You, you kindly had me on when I was trying to, um, to raise money for the Holy Core. And we, we did indeed have a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and I think we we were trying to raise about eight thousand seven hundred pounds, I think it was. Uh, uh, and that's that was our target. And uh, all the crowd funders are a little different. But Kickstarter being what it is means that unless you raise all the money you want, then you don't get any of it. Um, it's all or nothing. Um, and we were about it's a 30 day campaign we were running and we got it, it kind of became clear that we probably were going to struggle. And in the end, at the end of the 30 days, we'd raised pretty much half of what we had intended, which unfortunately meant we didn't get anything. Um, but fortunately, uh, during that campaign, uh, a gentleman called Alexander Mayer, who 
had been uh, also a donor to our first film, Chance Encounter, he reached out to me privately via email and just sort of said, look, um, if if you don't reach your goal, then, you know, maybe I can fund the whole project for you, um, which is one of those very pleasant but un, unusual uh, emails to receive. So, of course, I said, OK, great. So um, we carried on with the Kickstarter. And, and when it finished and it was unsuccessful, I, you know, obviously I went back to Alex and said, you know, if your very kind offer is still available, then let's let's talk. And so a few weeks went by and we just sorted it out behind the scenes and uh, and we were all systems go again with, with the fully funded film. So that was a, a really sort of unusual but very welcome turn of events. And he's listed as one of the executive producers. I believe I saw his name on the credits, right? That's right. That's it. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. What a what a gesture. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you guys nail it. The uniforms, the sets. It feels like a real episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, but yet you're doing it on a limited budget. Did you still do it on the same amount of money as we were looking for? That's right, we did. So he matched the Kickstarter, yeah. That's it, that's it exactly. Um, Because, you know, obviously when you're trying to raise the funds, you know, I I did my best kind of uh, ballpark figures on how much I thought we could make this film for minimum and made that. The, the amount we asked for so there, there wasn't much fat on the bone in terms of what we'd asked for um but frankly that was the amount i i said i could do it for and that was the amount alex kindly gave me so it was uh <laughs> it was on me to make sure that i could make the whole film happen for that amount of money so and you did i did thankfully yes <laughs> what about the actors because yeah some of the actors are great i think some stand out more than others if i might say like uh commander boltzman jennifer uh-huh. uh i thought she was spectacular there were some really good performances there. Um, are they donating uh, services, or is that a part of the part of the budget? Yeah, um, yeah, it was part of the budget. They're jobbing actors, but of course, the the fan film guidelines are sort of quite strict about you know you you can't pay people. So what we did was we, you know, I, I believe you do have to pay people if you want to get quality out of it. And so we did give them all a nominal fee, really primarily, really just so that they a thought we were a serious outfit and we weren't just going to you know drop them in the middle of you know some disastrous shoot but also frankly more than that so that they actually will hold the dates in their diaries for us and will actually turn up knowing the script and, and what the film's about and what their lines are um and so we weren't like paying any of these people huge salaries but i think you know if if somebody it's I can't build all these sets and schedule it and then not have one actor turn up on the day when we all needed to be there because they got an actual proper job come through. So I have to just give them at least a sort of token nominal amount just to sort of keep their diaries free so that the thing can actually happen. But um, but yeah, nobody was like getting like paid, you know, in some huge capacity. Building the sets, what you built the sets personally? Yes, that's right. I did. Yeah, yeah. How do you get the screens, the monitors, the the that looks so much like the original series, of course, uh, whether it be in the shuttle pod or on the bridge. Yeah, so it, I think the reason it looks um, as sort of close to the source material as, as it does is because I just said, OK, well, let's just try and make it the same way that they made them on the show. Um, and so in like the first and second seasons and the real early next gen, they, they literally had just uh, like transparencies that were black and clear and the black areas no light could penetrate through and the clear obviously it could and they would literally just cut out lighting gels and sort of tape them on the clear parts um which is why they're a lot more monochromatic in the earlier seasons because it, every different piece of every different color was a different piece of gel that had to be manually glued or taped down so but then as time went on into the 90s um these sort of large decent printers were available that could print uh, these backlit um graphics in a way that the blacks were solid enough so that the light couldn't get through the black areas, but could through the colored bits. And that's why you see those graphics get more and more complex as, you know, into DS9 and Voyager and so on. Um, and so I just looked for printing services. Um, and there was, there was one that you just mail off your design, uh, you know, you upload it and they post it out to you in a nice poster tube. And they're designed specifically as backlit signs. I suspect most of what they get is, you know, signs for some shop or whatever, but of course you can upload whatever you want. And so so that's how you get the graphics and I design them in um in Photoshop and just make sure that the scale is right and I try and make sure that the layouts I I come up with 
are very true to the to the ones we saw on the show often if you look at if you google image like l cars which is the official name for these graphics you see all sorts of people that have kind of bashed them together in ways that just don't look quite legitimate um so i wanted to make sure i wasn't one of those people um and so then once you get your transparencies yeah you can also of course buy the uh like uh, they call it acrylic tinted acrylic but i think in the u.s it was always under the brand name plexiglass um but it's just sort of semi-transparent black tinted plastic really and uh yeah you just have to figure out what sizes you want and you just uh, put in a, a sheet saying i need sheets this big of these dimensions and then you just have to uh yeah stick your uh, your graphic to one side of that and stick a big light behind it and in theory you should have something that looks just like the ones on the show yeah they look so slick uh i'm kind of getting the impression that they probably weren't the most expensive prop it's funny i i wonder t- to be honest like because it starts adding up because um that those that to those uh, printouts from the printers, they're actually pretty expensive. And then they'll, there's like a minimum postage fee that they'll send you and stuff. And you, some of them, obviously, I, I try and do as many of them in one order as I can. So I'm actually ordering fairly large, like two, three meter size uh, printouts, which I will then cut out because the, that printout has got multiple things on it. Um, and and then the plexiglass again, you know, to get it all shipped to you as well, because these places are never anywhere near where you live, of course. So by the time you add in postage and taxes and shipping and all, you know, all that stuff plus the cost of the stuff, it does start adding up. But I don't know if it's, yeah, I think, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to know which individual elements of these sets cost the most. It was just a sort of aggregate amount. Oh, by you the end must of it, know. Really. Was it the CGI? Was it the <laughs> actors? Was it? I know you know. <laughs> Honestly, I honestly I don't. I'd have to dig all through the accounts again. <laughs> well, you know the CGI part of it, it. It must represent what thirty seconds, forty-five seconds. It's not a lot. It's not a big part of it, right? But every moment matters so much. Yeah, that's right. And on on uh, on the first film, Chance Encounter, I'd done all the sort of exterior spaceship shots myself. Um, and it was actually Alex, the producer, um, the guy who was funding it all. He um, he suggested that a friend of his um, some, or somebody he'd worked with um, before um, do those this time. He sort of said, who's doing those exterior shots? And I'd actually kind of already found somebody else who I was sort of speaking to about him doing them. Uh, but, you know, if Alex is the executive producer and he said, oh, I, I think we should use this guy, I said, okay let's use let's use your man and and so so we did and he did a great job on them i mean i think they look amazing and i I said to him you know he he was so talented that he kind of had quite a lot of free reign on them i would just sort of say look this is i mean he'd read the script and so on but of course i i had to just sort of reiterate this is what's very important in this shot you know um and and yeah he just came back with some really sort of stunning visuals and uh yeah it was like really quite quite easy to work with him really just over email and he'd send over some previsd ones and i'd just say yep looks good or just tweak this and and that was that he'd send over the final versions yeah there's a lot of work being done here i looked into the behind the scenes about the beaming down yes which ironically actually did we i i didn't eventually put into the film uh that was something that was in a in an earlier draft of the i was script wondering because I, I was yeah. looking for it yeah <laughs> that's right and uh because originally um we were, we had a a shot where that kind of uh, message in a bottle, the signal buoy thing, we were going to see that get beamed up from the surface of the moon that it's on. But it's one of those ones where it's like, you know what, that's, we don't need that. It's, it's in, in fact, it's probably better that we don't see it. It's a, makes a more, it's a nicer dramatic device to just cut from the captain saying, bring it aboard to bam, close up of it being placed on a desk. It was just redundant to sh- see it beaming up. But when I'd made that behind the scenes video, that the plan still was to show it beaming up. So yeah. <laughs> In Chance Encounter, you had already created the shuttle pod. That's right, yes. So you could reuse that, I'm assuming, for the Holy Core, of course. That's right, although it did, um, it had been in storage, and when I say storage, I mean, you know, a, a sort of rickety old shed that's damp, you know. Um, it, it, wasn't in, <laughs> it wasn't in some super slick storage facility somewhere. Um, and so it needed a bit of work to sort of tidy it up and sort of wipe the mold off it, and a bit of it had warped a little bit, but it wasn't too bad. But uh, in addition to what we had already got from the first film, uh, I also needed to, to like add some new stuff to it, which you don't sort of really particularly see uh, consciously in the film. But 
for the first film, the shuttle really didn't doesn't get much screen time. So for this one, it, it does get a lot more screen time. And so I, I did a lot of work to make the kind of dashboard console thing that they sit at. That was like much better build quality this time because the actors were going to be using it a lot more and they had to like rest their weight on it at times and, and stuff. Um, and we put a little console in the middle of that console which has a little sort of tablet computer inside it with little looping video animations and stuff. And, you know, just just general improvements all around, really. We put red alert lights in it this time because we needed to have a red alert going on, which we didn't before. So, yeah, it, it's essentially we, you know, 90 percent of that set we already had. But there was still a fair bit to do to get it ready for this film. Did you alter the script to accommodate for that, knowing that you had the shuttle pod already as a set piece? Yeah, when we, well, not so much alter, just like create from scratch, knowing we did. Um, it was like, you know, that we've got that set, you know, it's let's use it. it. It would have been a bit silly not to really when, but as soon as you start looking at the budget and stuff, you know, it's like, yeah, let, let's reuse that bad boy because it's just sat there. And if we don't reuse it soon, it, it will never be reused because it's just going to rot more and more in some shed. So, <laughs> you know, use it while you can kind of thing. What about another one? We've done Chance Encounter. We've done Holy Core. They're both getting great reviews. I think the Holy Core even more so than the first. Yet at the same time, you're competing with CBS guidelines. You're you're competing with funding, uh, your own ambitions, your own ability to write a new story. Uh, is there another one in you? Um, I think certainly in theory, yes. I mean, there's certainly another script um, in me. I mean, I don't have any specific ideas, but I I I feel there's a wealth of things that I could you know go crazy with and start thinking about if if i wanted to so certainly i think i could come up with another script but it's not just me by the way it's my friend uh, paul who co-writes with me but i think together we could certainly come up with some more you know hopefully quite cool stories and stuff in the star trek universe or even in not star trek related at all but um as for as you say though you know there's there's these fan film guidelines which frankly I, i'm not too concerned about because i think the holy core fits in with all of those and um and so so they don't concern me too much. But of course, it's it's the funding, really. Um, and also it does take I mean, from concept of a story to the film is finished on YouTube It's probably taken about 18 months. Um, and it it, it, it is a, a lot of work. I mean, it's it's when you're not working to earn a living, you're doing that. And so it's a big commitment to, to do one of these. And so if I was going to do another one, I kind of feel that it would be prudent to try and uh have even more budget than this one did so that i can delegate the tasks out to more people and and also end up with a higher end production um, when it was finished so I, I feel just doing another one in the exact same style as chance encounter in the holy core i.e me basically building it all in my living room and doing it all um I, I, that doesn't appeal too much because i think well we've got two of those already it's like let's up our game or 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 maybe but you would still reuse the shuttle pod. You would still use the bridge. Well, I, I'm not sure. I mean, possibly, but I think, well, two things. One, I, I'm not sure that three films in a row in that little shuttle pod, that might start to get a little wearing, perhaps. No, but maybe it, um, maybe it deserves a, of a two-minute scene. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Um, but, but, uh, but in terms of the rest of those sets, uh, they, they no longer exist. Um, we don't have them anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, the ready room we shot first, and the plan was always to turn the ready room into the deflector control room. So uh, the ready room was always destined to only be around for a few weeks, um, and then it got heavily modified and changed into the next set. And then I simply didn't have anywhere to store them. Um, and also, frankly, they're not, I mean, you know, they look good on screen. They look good enough on screen for the job, but they're not, you know, then these things aren't like you can't they're not that sturdy or that well made and in and, and bad storage which I don't even have uh, they wouldn't have lasted long this is not structural carpentry the camera passes over them they get the shot and beyond that it's a liability that's it exactly that I mean this is like using the, like, the, the cheapest thinnest wood you can get away with that will do what you need it to do on the day I mean they're all clipped together I mean they're not even you know uh you know you're just using like big strong clothes pegs basically to hold the things together they're not like immersive environments that you can kind of walk around at your leisure like the star trek continues ones the ray tessie ones you know 
Um, they're, they're not that. They're just, uh, you know, a, a flat that's resting against a stand with a giant clothes peg on top of it. You know, they're, so they were never going to be long for this world, really. They're, they're, they're only built in order to make this film, frankly. And, and they did that. And so, yeah, that's the end of it. I mean, I've, I've kept the plexiglass and the control panels, but, you know, because it was stupid to throw them. But they were so specific to this film that I'm not sure how easily you could reuse them again anyway, really. The new Picard series. Any thoughts on that? I mean, it seems to be having some difficulties getting through production here, but uh, it probably will happen. Uh, my understanding, which is, you know, far from authoritative, is is that, it, yeah, I, I certainly agree that I think it will be broadcast. I don't think I've heard rumors that it's maybe in trouble or has been delayed a little bit and that they're, uh, I've heard, you know, uh, all this stuff about uh, budget cuts and it not being on Netflix internationally and, and, and uh, it might be looking at a reduced budget and stuff. To be honest, all that I'd, I'm not too interested in, really. But in terms of what the quality of the finished program will be, I must admit I'm sort of uh, I, I'm, I'm, I want it to be very good, obviously. But honestly, I'm a little bit leaning towards the fact that I probably I'm probably going to be disappointed personally, I think, um, because from what I gather as well, and I must admit I'm not some expert on this, but from what I gather, it's a lot of the same writers who are uh, doing Discovery. And Discovery, personally, for me, I, I don't feel is very well written. It, it certainly doesn't chime with me. And so if it's the same people writing Picard, then I don't expect that Picard will chime with me, which is sad because I'd really like to like it. But and, it, and I may well. I'll have to wait and see. But that's that's how I feel at the moment. Well, always good chat with you, Gary. Um, I'd like to do this again. I mean, but you got to make another show. That's the caveat, isn't it? That's the rub. <laughs> that's the rub. <laughs> If I were to ask you now, and I put the gun to your head, Gary, or the phaser, Gary, is there going to be another one, yes or no? Because I know other people are always, once they like the first two, they want a third one, of course. That's right, yeah. Um, well, I, I certainly I certainly um, would like to do another one at some point, but I, but my honest opinion at the moment is it's it will probably have to be a bit different. I, I can't just do the, the same kind of production model a third time. Would you change it up from uh, Star Trek Next Generation and do um, the original series or Voyager or Deep Space Nine? Because I don't see a lot of that happening. Yeah, I think with Deep Space Nine, that like that would specifically probably have to be on Deep Space Nine. And then you'd be talking about, well, are you just background characters like that we never saw on screen and we just hear O'Brien in the back corner or, or Cisco walking past? So DS9, I think that location is very specific to that series. Um, so I don't think a DS9, and I suspect that's probably why there hasn't been any DS9 fan films, not that I'm aware of. Um, I mean, frankly, I, I'm not really too bothered with which kind of era it was in, because I think the, the stories are always kind of the, 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 the key of it, and that should kind of not really matter which period it's in. The reason we pick Next Gen is because... Well, because 13-year-old Gary O'Brien was making little VHS tapes, uh... <laughs> I saw that. That's right. Nice one, man. And, and well, in fact, we, we were using the props that I owned at that age uh, in the first film, the phaser prop. I think I already owned it that back then and we were still using it in a film in 2017, the first one. So, so yeah, it was my favorite one. And, and also, I think I already had the good Anovos uh, uniform tunic. And so, like, when we were deciding on what era to do the, the first film, it was like, well, we've got like, these two props and one one half of one uniform it's like well that's more than we've got of the others so next gen it is but also frankly i mean i think this what with obviously star trek continues um but then all the myriad of other original series ones i think for me personally i'm a, a sort of a little sick of seeing the original series now um in fan form um because and i and to be honest i don't think you're realistically going to be able to top what you know vic and the star trek continues guys did so um, I, I personally would probably steer away from the original series, but otherwise, I'd, 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 I wouldn't mind what era it was in, frankly. Yeah. Those uniforms, did you make those or did you order those in? And the little uh, intercom button, I wanted to know. Communicators, excuse me. Yes, the communicators. So those, I believe, if I'm, my memory serves, they're from a company called, it's like Escapes, but it's Xscapes. So Xscapes.com or something like that. And... Uh, and the, the, yeah, they sell them because the, I, 
they I think they advertise them as being from the original molds on the show. If they're not, they certainly look like they are to my eye. And they they just got the right paint job, so they're not they're not metallic and they're not shining. You know, uh, they to me they look very authentic. And so and they're pretty cheap. They're only like twelve twelve dollars each or something, and they've just got the little bit of Velcro on the back. So yeah, I'll give a little plug to them because I think their products are good. So X Scapes, I think, um, and then. As I said, the like the guy's gold uniform I already own. That's an an, an a Novos one, um, and then the two Starfleet characters, the two women, um, I got my uh, what is it? She's my mother-in-law, effectively my mother-in-law, uh, with a now ex-girlfriend, unfortunately. Um, oh dear. Uh, but yeah, she's quite the seamstress, and so I was able to get the patterns uh, from I think they're, again Bad Wolf costumes. And they don't, as far as I'm aware, I might be wrong, but they don't sell costumes. They just sell patterns, I think. I might be wrong. Um, but, uh, yeah, they, they do these, like, really good patterns, which mean nothing to me. But um, they, they were, you know, the, uh, the seamstress lady. She was she was wonderful at it, my mother-in-law, Felicity. Um, and uh, she, yeah, she she was able to make them. And, and Bad Wolf costumes, they also have this, like, this giant PDF document with like where to get the fabric and all sorts of stuff, which was way over my head. Um, but I just printed it out and gave it all to her. And a few weeks later, she we had these like really good looking costumes. Um, and we obviously we'd got the actresses cast by then, so we we made them to, to their measurements, so they so they fit pretty well. So so when they're sitting in the shuttlecraft and you can only see them from the waist up, are they wearing whatever they want from the waist down? Um, I think for the actor, oh yeah, because okay, first of all, yeah. Um, so in the Holy Core, um, Hannah, she's, it's, the girls' ones are one piece. So, yeah, she's just got to wear the whole thing. She doesn't really have a choice. Um, I'm pretty sure she didn't have any shoes or socks on, though. And then uh, Drew, who was the, her companion in, in that shuttle in the Holy Core, his one is kind of long as well. It kind of comes, it's kind of like a three-quarter length jumper top thing. So he was as well. Um, and, but as for the first film... Uh, I believe we just said to uh, Sartaj, who was in the shuttle, we said, just wear just black trousers, man, because you never know. We might catch some glimpse it's just that we don't intend to. So he was just wearing a pair of black trousers, I think. So best to be safe than sorry when shooting, because otherwise you're doing some nasty frame by frame color correction, painting something out all for want of saying, just wear black trousers, man. You know, so listen, there's a lot of work being done on these programs. I happen to have it on the background. I was at my mother's house. And she was raving, and she's not a Star Trek fan, about how how well done these are. Share them. Put them on your Facebook. Put them on your Twitter. Share them. Get the word out. I mean, why not? You can see there's a lot of work being done on them. Uh, just go that extra mile if you can. Yes, please do. Please do. Much appreciated if you can share them, because why not, eh? Like you say, why not? Gary O'Brien, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you, man. Thank you.